All right, here we go. There we go. We got sound. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome for attending the, uh, uh, thank you for attending the Nebraska Ag Expo and the Expo EDU sessions. And uh, good to see that you've got such a, uh, that you've got an interest in commodity marketing because that is today's topic. And we've got three experts that we're going to walk through and talk about what's going on in the markets, what you should follow and, and why. How does that impact your operation? Uh, before we introduce the panel, I'll introduce myself. My name is Chad Moyer. I work for KTIC and the Nebraska Rural Radio Association. We are, we are the only farmer-owned group of radio stations in the nation. We're actually owned by a cooperative. 4,000 farmers and ranchers own the co-op, and the co-op operates 14 radio stations across the state and a statewide network as well. So just happy to work for you guys, to work for farmers. and. Uh, from here, let's go ahead and meet our panel. We have three people here today. Doug Simon, he works for Trade Haas. We have uh, Jeff Peterson, Heartland Farm Partners. And in the middle there, the uh, rose among the thorns, if you will, uh, Matt Weigand. He's with uh, Futures One. So uh, again, we're going to talk with each one of these individually. Again, I want this to be interactive. I want to hear your questions. Uh, and if, uh, if you do ask a question, who knows? Maybe we'll get a little uh, little something here. We want, we want to encourage this uh, back and forth dialogue. But first, let's get to know our panelists. Uh, Doug Simon, Trade Haas, tell us a little bit about you. How did you get into this commodity game and, and things like that? A little background. Trade Haas is based in Lincoln, Nebraska and we have 20 brokers that we work with uh, in various places in the Midwest. Work with, most of our farmers are within probably about four hours of Lincoln. We work with we're RJO, um, RJO Bryan introducing broker, also work with crop insurance. I started in this, had a class with Jim Kendrick when I was in college. A lot of Older guys like me probably remember him. A uh, great class and got involved in commodities, got involved in meat exporting, ran a food company for 10 years, been a broker in this area arena for 22 years, and work a lot with a lot of good farm families you know, throughout this uh, Midwest area. So just an initial question for you, just to kick things off. Uh, what is the most difficult thing in commodity marketing today? In, in 2022, going into 2023, what's the most difficult thing? I think anything, I mean, we have always had volatility in all the years that I've been in here. We've been to $8 corn three different times and we've washed out after that. The commodities are already always variable, but it's always a question about not trying to predict what the markets are going to do, but how are you going to deal with it? What kind of strategies are you going to employ? How do I look at my farm from a risk standpoint and how do I deal with that? And that's the most important thing. But every day is exciting in terms of what we're doing, in terms of coming in and working with farmers and looking at those the changing markets because it's never the same. There's some basic concepts that are similar every year, but it's, we've seen, can't say that I've seen it all, but we've, I've seen a lot in the last several years, so. Yeah, definitely, good to have you here, Doug. Thanks for Thanks, joining Chad. us. Uh, Matt Weigand, he's with Futures One. Matt, give me a little bit of background about you uh, and uh, kind of where you sit in the whole commodity thing. Uh, my name's Matt Weigand. Uh, I work with Futures One here uh, out of our office in Lincoln. Uh, I work with producers from Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, Missouri, uh, and Illinois a, a little bit too. Uh, say I work with you know, both you know, traditional row crop farms and a number of uh, cattle feeding operations as well, and some cow calf too. So uh, you cover a little bit broader spectrum on that front. Um, I'm on my 15th year year of uh, doing this, worked in the ethanol industry for a little while before that, and after uh, receiving my master's at UNL uh, a while ago now. All right. So, um, kind of same question. You know, the you, I'm not going to let you dip, duplicate his answer, but uh, what what do you think is a challenge? What's what's a high ranking uh, thing when it comes to marketing grain these days that uh, might be difficult to overcome, but not impossible? Well, I mean, you know, depending on where you were last year, production. Uh, say working with a lot, number of guys in southwestern Nebraska, northwestern Kansas, when uh, you can't even bail, you know, you end up bailing your Milo. It's you know, not a great situation and yeah, that brings in another set of circumstances to work with uh, when you don't have production versus you have volatility and have production, it's one thing, and then it's another thing to not have production and still you know, be somewhat at the mercy of the markets with you know, both your crop insurance set up and uh, you know, if you need to feed significant amount of your own bushels, things like that to work around that. I think there's you know, the variability in production that we see in you know, some years in some areas is you know, something that you always have to work around that it's, tell guys it's always better to have too much production than not enough. That it, you know, you can work around that a lot easier. 
And then the final uh, person on our panel today is Jeff Peterson from Heartland Farm Partners, again, based here in Lincoln as well. A little bit of background about you, Jeff. How long have you been uh, working with farmers and, and trying to market grain? Do you have enough fingers and toes? You know, I don't. I'm going to have to dig out a few more here. So, no, um, Jeff Peterson, Heartland Farm Partners. We uh, work with farmers on their marketing, make sure that we're taking some of the kind of the proven challenges and, and, and strategies that have been used in the grain industry and focusing on managing that futures price, that basis, and that carry. But what we really pride ourselves on is really helping meet everybody where they're at, helping with that personalization, helping on the education side, which is very important to us. My time got started back in northeast Nebraska many years ago. Um, growing up on a farm, agriculture was very important, was very active in FFA, and came through school, had Dr. Kendrick, just like what um, others in this you know, room have, have showed and what Doug had ended up having, and, and went to work for Cargill and had the opportunity to manage grain elevators for them up in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and back in Nebraska. But I, I knew I loved agriculture, but what I noticed is every day as I'd sit across buying grain, talking to my dad and brother were farming, I'd, I'd see that there was a lot of um, challenges with getting that grain marketed. So back in, in 2000, I, I transitioned away from Cargill, started then working uh, with individual farmers since the early 2000s on just developing and implementing those personalized plans. And we've got a great team that we've been able to work with to, to go ahead and go out there and just help, help the farmers on the marketing side, Chad. The initial question I have for you, Jeff, is uh, you talked uh, about that uh, basis decision and carry and things like that. So you, if you listen to the radio, you listen to your farm broadcaster, you're constantly hearing a futures update, right? You hear that once an hour or twice an hour. But why is it important to have an idea of where basis is and what, why, where carry is? Is it, uh, do you get a premium later versus now? Why is that also an important part of a marketing plan? Well, if you look back, um, and, and Doug said a lot of great things early in the beginning, talked about how each year you got to have a good plan to be able to put things in place to capture that futures price and get that right. But although I think all of us would agree up here, the rest of the story is ultimately you want to make sure you manage that, that basis side because we know that that cash price is made up of futures and basis. And if you're going to do the best job on the marketing side, you need to go ahead and tackle each one of those decisions separately. And that gets back to your decision on the type of marketing tool you're going to use. But you do need to manage the basis and give you an idea. This is one of those years where we really get a chance to really see it. You know, you could see, you could pick up in many cases if you'd have locked in a cash price earlier compared with managing the basis. You know, you might have left 50, 70, maybe even a dollar worth of movement on the basis side on the table. And, and all of a sudden, when you look at the amount of bushels you're producing, that's a lot of money. And then you come in and you talk about managing that spread or that carry between those individual futures months. And, and those are proven technology, or not technologies, but proven strategies that the commercial grain traders have used for years. And that's what we, we really all want to help you to understand. How do you implement those type of things in there? Because what we have to prepare for is these markets are going to turn over and we could be on the cusp of that. And we have to make sure we're ready to get every penny out of this market we can so that you can cover those higher input costs that you've got. Very good. So that's our panel today, Doug, Matt, and Jeff. And uh, again, I want this to be interactive. I want this, I want to hear questions from you. I've got a few prepared, but I want this to be interactive. So as you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, you can shout it out. I can bring the mic, whatever the case may be. We'll, we'll do that. Uh, so please think of your questions. Let's, let's have a conversation here. Um, I'm, I'm going to get started and, uh, you know, like you say, kind of a few uh, starter questions. Matt, let's start with you in the middle. Just tell me what is the main thing or what, are, what is having the biggest influence in the markets right now, you know, here in, in the first full week in December? I think in the immediate term, you know, we're kind of seeing a little bit of our seasonal changeover come to play. A lot of times you see markets rally a bit, you know, into the first of January. We haven't, you know, obviously haven't seen that this past week, except for soybeans a little bit. You're also seeing a lot of spillover from the outside markets. Uh, crude oil has made 2022 lows again today. We've got diesel, you know, well, you know, we're about a buck forty off where we were, you know, four weeks ago on your your board price on diesel. You're seeing that in unleaded too. You know, maybe not the pump yet, but on the board it's come down substantially. You, you have, you know, all those warning signs of a recession blinking. You know, that's kind of thro throwing out there. You know, I think that's kind of spilling over in the absence of other fresh news really through the grain markets. 
you'll have a report tomorrow. December report's usually not very exciting. It's the January report with final harvest acres and numbers. Yeah, that'll there'll be a big market mover, bigger market mover in yeah, most years. So you kind of have you know, the absence of you know a lot of fresh news driving the grain market in the sense that harvest is over. South America is, you know, doesn't have major issues right now. There's always always some issues out there somewhere. They're not real deep into their growing season yet to really, you know, except for wheat, to really you know, get something that provides a lot of excitement there. And then just kind of you know, liquidity wanes a little bit. You see some extra volatility. You're a bit more sensitive to the outside markets, and that's kind of you push us around here, and you let it let us drift drift along and drift lower, and uh, you see see some of the action we've seen here the last uh, you know, week week or two here as we uh, get ready to you know, wrap up the year for uh, you most everybody. Yeah. Uh, Doug, what do you think? Uh, are, are there some things that are more important, less important than what he mentioned? Uh, other things that are at play right now? What do you think, Doug? Well, the biggest, most exciting thing over the last three months has been basis opportunities in eastern Nebraska coming off a of combine. We were 60, 70 over in the Bartlett Council Bluffs and not so hot up into, into Blair and into, into Columbus ADM. You know, we were more in the 30, 40, 50s over, but the levels, we have a tremendous task of moving corn from like surplus areas in the eastern corn belt out to the western corn belt. We've lost 900 million bushels of wheat and corn and milo out in southwest Kansas and the Kansas feedlots and so that's the big demand area this year. So the big issue we've seen is that the feedlots down in, Port in Dodge City um, uh, down in that area has been trading two dollars and thirty cents over to two dollars and fifty cents over. Those numbers were, have weakened by thirty to fifty cents over the last three weeks. Uh, they kind of peaked, the panic was going on in that market, you know, prior to Thanksgiving. And so now we've we've kind of receded as they've filled up some of those slots for now. But for us, moving corn off the combine was, you know, a good move because the basis was so strong in a lot of these areas. But also this, you know, late uh, October, early November opportunity to move corn back into Kansas. So we haven't we see that sometimes where we're seeing corn fobbed out of central Nebraska, southern central Nebraska, but this year especially. So there's a colossal effort, I should say. A lot of that corn in the eastern corn belt flows south to the southern kind of markets down into Alabama and Kentucky into the feed markets on rail. Um, maybe some of that corn might come from Iowa and Minnesota. Last year that corn didn't move this way, uh, potentially because they had drier crops up in Minnesota and the Dakotas. But there's a a massive dislocation going from surplus to deficit areas, and that's happening. Ethanol margins are weak, weak probably in the bottom 10% of what they've been over the last uh, you know, 12 years, and the export markets are really weak as well on the corn side. We've been exporting beans, but the corn side is pretty weak. So really the big play this year is on basis. All right, let's talk about energy. It's been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, we'll do a couple of questions on, first of all, Jeff, maybe you can talk about the importance of crude oil to this market. We'll talk about renewables in a moment, but um, I've had the opportunity to be in Minneapolis twice in the last three weeks, so I get, uh, I've seen a lot of gas stations from here and, and back. Talk about a range. The high I saw was 345, and the low was 234. So can you um, talk a little bit about crude and I guess where fuel, fuel use is an important part of today's market, if you would? Sure, definitely. So what's interesting, so we go back and if we'd have been having this discussion, say, 20 years ago, we'd have said, okay, let's just make this simple. If we're trying to determine what the value of corn and soybeans are, let's look at it, what it's worth for food, what's it worth for feed, all right? And then along comes basically the push, as we got in the mid-2000s, with the renewable fuel. And then all of a sudden we introduced the energy component. So the minute we did that, we're taking corn, turning it into ethanol. We're also going ahead and taking soybeans and we're physically turning that into initially biodiesel. And then we'll talk more about renewable diesel in a moment. And you bring all that together. So now we've got the corn market, we've got the soybean market tied over to crude. When we ended up having the invasion, the war that Russia had with Ukraine, saw a big run up and surge in that crude oil market. And that was lending support and bringing that over to what we saw on the corn and the soybean side. But as Matt pointed out a little bit ago, now we pulled that market way back, we're seeing some weakening. Anytime we do that, we're going to have a headwind against our corn and soybean markets because a portion of their value, a portion of their demand is tied directly back to what's going on in the crude oil market chat. What about, uh, you mentioned a renewable diesel. How big of a and sustainable aviation fuel, how big of a deal is that going to be? Well, it's going to be a big thing that we're talking about down the road, so let's just take talk a little bit about renewable diesel first. So we're all very familiar as we talk about biodiesel, but let's just go through that a second. 
So we're going to take some type of fat source, and we could be taking soybean oil, we're going to take it through what they call the esterification process and come up with methyl ester. We then are going to blend that into basically diesel fuel or number or regular number two diesel, maybe a 5% blend, maybe up to a 20% blend, but but over the history, a lot of there's been a lot of problems with that. It, it changes the gel point on the fuel. A lot of people have had some bad experiences with that. But we've got that from the biodiesel side. But now we start talking about the renewable diesel side. Now the renewable diesel side, a different process, and really kind of think of it this: we're taking some type of fat source. It could be soybean oil. It could be canola. It could be tallow, and it could be used fryer grease. And you're taking it through more of the refinery process. And you're, and you're turning it into diesel fuel that's chemically identical to basically regular diesel fuel. And so, and, and with the big push out there of ultimately these low carbon fuels, you see in California, you see in Oregon, you see in Washington, all physically want a, a number and they want the diesel fuel, they want the renewable diesel out there to basically lower the carbon footprint. And, and where this comes in, just to give you an idea just on the renewable diesel side, just to take care of what's being desired for the California market, the Oregon market, Washington market, basically if, if most of that was sourced from soybean oil, that would mean that we would need to probably take the oil from about 90% of our soybeans would need to be crushed to be able to be turned into renewable diesel. Now a couple things, so we just kind of put this in perspective. Traditionally when we crush those soybeans, we're getting roughly about 11.4 pounds, it could be 11.2 to 11.6 pounds of basically soybean oil are coming back out. Um, it takes about 8.3 pounds of soybean oil to go ahead and make a gallon of renewable diesel. So that gives you an idea of how big a deal that we're physically talking about. Now the challenge with that is that we do not have enough crush capacity currently. There's about 650, maybe 700 million bushels of crush capacity, additional crush capacity on the books. Now, Doug had mentioned about how poor margins were on, on ultimately on ethanol, and they are, but just the opposite is going on over on in the soybean crush facility. They're basically a printing press for money, and they've got the ability to go ahead and make a lot of money on it, and, and so we're going to continue to see more crush happen. So what, what renewable diesel has the ability to do to the soybean industry is a lot what we ended up seeing ethanol end up doing to the corn industry. The only difference we've got to remember though, okay, um, I'll give you an example. Go move out to California for a second. There's two refineries out there that will be coming online and should be fully up to speed on the renewable diesel side here uh, towards the end of 2024. Between those two plants, they'll produce about 1.5 billion gallons of renewable diesel. Now, the challenge out there is, is that, that doesn't, the, the, the feedstock for that doesn't necessarily have to come from the U.S., though. We, so we got to remember, we could very easily see some of that end up coming in from Argentina or from Brazil. Now, where things get exciting is that, that what we're talking about there is a big market. Now, here's the thing I want to caution everybody on. What we're talking about on the, on the renewable diesel and in a moment on sustainable aviation fuel doesn't necessarily dictate anything about where the market's going to go today or tomorrow. It's just an underlying factor that we have within these markets. If we step off into the sustainable aviation fuel, that's basically the airlines industry's way of being able to go green, right? And, and the nice thing for agriculture about that, there's two pathways that we can get there. We can further refine the renewable diesel, go that pathway, or we can go ahead and come from the ethanol side and ADM and GIVO are coming together on that side, and there's others too, that where we can further refine the ethanol and come into the sustainable aviation fuel. That particular industry, to give you a feel, just the scope of it, in the U.S. is about between 25 and 30 billion gallons of potential demand, and if we look across that particular industry all across the world, that's about 100 billion gallons. Now, there's a lot of hurdles and a lot of steps in that, but that kind of, Chad, gives you an idea of what's going on in that industry. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, the one takeaway that, uh, hold on, uh, one, one takeaway that I just heard that I didn't realize is um, sustainable aviation fuel from ethanol. That's, that's a possibility? That's where the ADM Columbus plant is going. Yeah. That's where the other ADM 
the two plants are going. So yeah, that, yeah that's a big deal. So just as we're talking about energy, we'll come back in a moment. Uh, you two, uh, Doug, is energy is such a big part of it. Is there anything else to, about the energy conversation that we should be aware of right now? Any addition, Matt? Well, I, I think just watching to see how demand in general go, holds together coming forward, you're seeing you know, transitions from different energy sources, you know, efficiency, you know, gains, things like that. You know, who knows how, you know, how many passenger vehicles transition to electric. You know, where does that market go that you know, we've seen a you know, consistent you know, little shrinkage over the last few years? You know, if that accelerates, you know, do we need less ethanol? Do we have ethanol blend rates? You know, how do we uh, adapt to that changing market? And you know, as mentioned, ADM Columbus changing, changing the scope of where, you know, where their output's going. How is that going to move around is going to be a, a big kind of driving factor over the next couple of years that you know, maybe, you know, maybe it, you know, electric vehicles you don't catch on, government subsidies change there, we see an you know, increase in ro you know, road fuels again. You know, how that kind of plays in is going to be a, you know, a bigger factor, and you know, the biofuel of yesterday isn't going to be the biofuel of tomorrow, and it's going to, take, you know, it's going to be a messy process to get from point A to point B, and you know, that's where we get, that's how you get the volatility that everybody loves in the markets. Yep. All right, question for the gentleman in the white hat. Go ahead. Okay, so the question is, if there's a big potential for soybean oil, when you crush soybeans, you get oil and you get meal. So the question is, what do we do with the meal? Are there enough livestock mouths out there to feed? Who wants to take that question? Doug? We got two plants that are potentially coming into Nebraska, up in David City, it's an AGP plant, and then up in North Fork. So we got two plants that are coming on, and so that's going to go into animal feed. We'll go into hogs and into chickens. We'll Lincoln Premium poultry is down in Fremont. Uh, that they're feeding you know, meal too. So that's a good question. Like this last week in the markets, Argentina turns a lot of hot and dry. What happens? Meal goes up 50 bucks a ton. Oil dropped off, soybean oil dropped off about 12 cents a ton, or 12 cents a, uh, a gallon. So it, it had a pretty big drop. You know, but the, Argentina basically exports all meal. They don't export soybeans. Brazil exports soybeans. So, but yeah, it, it could pressure your feed costs and stuff, but there's also growing demand here, like at Costco, those chicken place, you know, place in, in Fremont, that's a big deal. That's a big demand for not only corn, but also for the meal. To add to that too, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think companies like AGP and, and some others are doing some work in the Pacific Northwest uh, to some of their export facilities. So they are anticipating a fair amount of meal to come from our part of the world that'll go out on rail to the Pacific Northwest and then a, on a Panamax to the ASEAN region or, or wherever is, am I correct in saying that? Anybody got thoughts on that? I, I'd say you're correct. I mean, the margin's going to bid for the protein for feed, you know, whether it's solar grain, whether it's corn, whether it's, there's various ways to skin the cat. And, uh, you know, if we're going to have a big uptick in available soy meal because of bigger domestic crushing rates, you know, we're going to find a way to use it, whether it's, you know, increases in domestic poultry, domestic hogs, you know, does it price into cattle rations in various ways, maybe as well as, you know, if, it, if it's on sale and, you know, they're going to find a way to use it overseas, whether, you know, make the container freight upgrades and, and things of that nature, especially with, uh, you know, growing, growing uh, protein demand in Asia, there's going to be ways and there's going to be a, a way to find a home for that, that product. Good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. So the question is, what is the production cost difference between biodiesel and the, and now what we're going to call renewable diesel? Oh, so oil-based diesel versus renewable diesel. Uh, do we know enough about production or what it, how it might play out, Jeff? So, a great question. I asked, uh, had a chance out at the farm shot at Kearney. There's a consultant out of Minneapolis that just focuses on the biodiesel industry, and I asked him that was question. Was that Boon G? Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, yeah. go ahead. But anyway, um, the whole thought behind it, and I'll just, I, I can't give you the exact numbers. It doesn't work unless it's basically mandated to, to be, work the low carbon side. And, and so that's, that's the challenge with it, is that it, it, the production cost is higher, and, and definitely it'd be cheaper to use the, the diesel, but when they're looking at the requirement of wanting to see the low carbon side out there, that's, that's what's going to drive it. Now, one thing I want to mention about this, um, 
one of the big pullbacks that we ended up seeing in the soybean market came back really when we ended up seeing the RFS number come out and the RVO numbers, the renewable volume obligations. And everybody looked at that and they said, well, on the advanced biofuels and basically what should equate over to diesel fuel, they're not mandating basically an, uh, enough of that and therefore our industry and what we think we're going to have for demand for all the supply isn't there and it's like I think the market really overreacted and, and one of the things I'll say that we have to kind of follow the trail of how this is all coming together. Let's think back to ethanol for a second. When these ethanol plants were built we had a lot of farmer money, venture money that came in but the big difference is the companies involved in putting these renewable diesel facilities in are the oil companies. They're teaming up with somebody who's supplying that, but you've got the Exxon, the mobiles, and they're coming into that industry. They're putting investing billions of dollars. They've got lobbying power, and this is a big change because normally what's been happening, anything that's been on the renewable side, we haven't been working with the oil industry. It's been a fight against them. And we're even seeing this come in on the E15 side also. Um, where they're wanting to say, hey, you know what, we have to somehow show that we're greener than we are, you know, or we have to participate in this in some way. So that, that's going to be something where we want to watch going forward. All right. Uh, good questions. Keep, uh, keep your hands up if you have anything. Um, yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, what about the carbon credits? How, do you, how does that fit in? Ooh, a, dis a question about carbon credits. How does that play into this whole discussion? Anybody got thoughts about uh, the carbon markets? <laughs> Swing and a miss. Would you like to rephrase? Would you like to call a friend? <laughs> it's an immature market. It's yeah. a very new and developing market. And it's a market, which is good, because that means that there are people going to interact and trying to find value. You've got companies like FedEx and different airline companies that want to you know, sell carbon. And you've got other people that are, you know, can, like farmers that can you know, store carbon, so there's a market there for that, and it's developing, but do I know a lot about it? I mean, it's definitely one that's going to develop and, and build over time, and it's important, but, you know, the function of that, there's private interest in it, there's public interest in it, so it's something kind of like the ethanol market, it, it took, you know, that took really from the 1980s into the, you know, you know, 2006 before it really sort of blossomed, so it's something of the future, and it's definitely kind of, you know, come together over time. Yeah. I would say in that case, though, ethanol went like this. It seems like the carbon thing is all coming from this way down. Jeff, you had a thought. What do you... I was just saying, you know, as the market develops, you know, seeing how it develops and if it becomes a reliable market, you know, it will be, you know, another potential diversification for, for a farmer. I and mean, we, you know, farmers maybe or maybe not diversified as we were in, in 1965, you know, less, less livestock, less types of livestock. But then you, you know, if you can do you do some offsets and you know, also not have to do anything where you know let's say you sell you go bail your corn stock sell them while you're still going to have to replace your nutrient loss you know, there's a cost to that money you're receiving for your for your corn stock bail as well if you're able to transfer credits and not have to you know, move anything physically off your farm you know, it's another potential diversification tool you know, depending on how the markets develop and you know, if there's consistent policy and you know, what that opens up coming forward and you know consistent policy is always always going to be a question with a lot of these. So to go back and hit on your point a second and, and what I heard you say and if I miss this tell me um, what I heard you say is how does carbon credits necessarily fit into us wanting to try to go and work around these low carbon fuels um, you know and in that way there hasn't been anything that's tied that way but it would be a very natural thing just like when this RFO um, came out or the RVO came out they started talking about okay not only should we look at all of our renewable fuels maybe we need to look at these ERENs and how are we going to tie uh, basically biogas that's turned into electricity that's then powering vehicles that then is taking away the demand or miles driven on gasoline and somehow give them a credit so down the road could there be something proposed on carbon credits that is not there today that would say since this fuel is not being used or we're now using a lower fuel there is less carbon as a result coming out therefore there should be some credit come back that's possible that's not there today but my two cents on the carbon market just for a moment keep in mind the carbon market is nothing new we actually had contracts traded on the CME that went away because there was no volume time you know years ago 
but let's let's just look at it for what it is right now. For what it is right now, honestly, for companies that are involved in it, they're exploring to see at what price they can get farmers to sell them carbon. Okay, that that's what's happening right now. And really, if in most markets, it's really if you think about it, it's a marketing effort on the parts of these companies that are saying, I physically want to say that I'm I'm reducing my carbon footprint. So it's a marketing effort on their point right now. Now we're now where we truly discover what carbon is worth is the minute we start getting mandated levels put on it. Then we start seeing what people are willing to pay because let's look at it. All of a sudden, if I'm a company and I'm going to physically reduce my footprint on carbon and I'm going to do it through the acquisition of buying equipment or stuff, I can tell you right now what they would end up spending on that is way more than what they would physically at this point be able to come over with and, and physically pay for these offsets. So right now, the, what's being offered in the carbon market, in my opinion, it's it's not a thing even to look at yet. We're, we haven't even got warmed up on what those true values are. All right, great discussion. Uh, we only have about 15 minutes left, and I want to make sure we get to some other segments. We've talked a lot about uh, energy and, and some domestic things. Uh, I want to switch and transition to exports if we can, because we know how, how big exports are to agriculture and grains, I guess. Let's talk about our competition in South America for a little bit. What's going on? Because as you know, right, we have two growing seasons, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. How are things setting up in the Southern Hemisphere, Brazil, Argentina, and those other growing areas? Doug, we'll start with you. We've been in a La Nina the last three years, and we're still on that, and we're predicted to go to neutral to slightly El Nino conditions according to NOAA. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. You look at the last two years, Brazil's had reduced crops from both corn and soybeans because of the La Nina conditions, which also impacted us here last year in the Western Corn Belt especially. So they've had reduced crops there, but now at this point they've had additional acres and, and Brazil's been getting rain there. They're, they're low and like Matagrosso, but um, you know maybe in the 30 to 50 percent range. But uh, Brazil's actually been getting some rain where Argentina continues to be hot and dry. So what's changed from last year, if you looked out 30 to 60 days in Brazil and Argentina, they were hot and they were dry in all the forecasts all the way through last winter. So now we're seeing rain. So that's maybe one sign that the pattern is going to change. It's, it's going to be an important question because we're so dry out here in the Western Corn Belt. When you look at those monthlies on La Nina, they're kind of similar to what they were in 2011. December at this time, like where they were the last year. So it's going to be interesting to see if we actually do trend toward that more of a wetter pattern. We haven't seen it develop here in the U.S., but there are signs in Brazil that it's developing, but I think it's going to be important, especially out here, especially in Cass County where I'm from. I see a Cass County shirt over here where it's all dry land crops. There's no irrigation, very little irrigation. So, but they're off to a pretty good start in Brazil, but Argentina now has really come back into the news this last four days but it's, it's been dry down there, so that, that'll be the big question. But they're expected to increase production in Brazil on corn, you know, versus last year. And Argentina is, you know, kind of maybe supposed to increase their production. But one of the different private forecasters, they actually came back and reduced their Brazilian corn crop by about 6 million metric tons, and the, uh, the bean crops by about 4 million metric tons this last week. So they're, they're starting to bring those summers down a little bit from where they were versus USDA. Sure. Uh, Matt, uh, something that got a headline last week was this uh, uh, Argentine soy dollar program. Do you know do you know anything about that? And Because they, they did that, was it last year or two years ago? They, they've done it in the past. How big of a deal is that going to be for us this time around? Oh, I mean, there's probably going to be some short-term impacts. They did it you know, earlier in the summer. You essentially, you're working to pay your farmers in a, a better currency than, than uh, the rest of the country gets to use. Argentina has been plagued with high inflation for a long, long, you know, for a long, long time. I mean, not entire, their entire history, but most of it. Um, so, you know, a lot of times you know, the Argentina farmer will sit on their crop and uh, as the local currency depreciates, you, they, you generally you're exporting in dollar terms. Your crops, you know, it's a store of value, but it's better than converting into pesos. Whereas, you know, here, you know, a lot of times maybe you'd rather have the cash than have the corn in the bin. It's going to be, you know, some, you know, you're not going to see dramatic swings, you know, for the most part. In Argentina, that's the opposite case. You know, there, you know, they do some programs to, uh, you know, encourage farmers to export where it, 
it gives them a better uh, currency exchange you know, working through some of the state you know, state exporting agencies and things like that. You know, it's still limited by the size of the crop and what's available. At this point, you know, you're cleaning up the old crop. You know, their new crop won't be, won't be harvested until after the first of the year. We'll see if that program continues. That's going to be something to watch, as well as you know, where the U.S. dollar goes. Where the U.S. dollar index peaked at about a 115 you know, late summer. That's the highest it's been in 40 years. It's back down to around 105 today. It's still, that's still a very strong dollar. Um, you know, in 2012, when we had the high prices, the dollar index was sitting 78 to 80. You know, that kind of swing, you know, how that progresses coming forward with the interest rates and how the rest of the world catches up there is going to make a difference, you know, probably eventually in exports. Maybe not right now because some of the capacity constraints, but, you know, we get to next fall, you know, seeing where the dollar is, you know, where our production is, you know, that's going to become a, probably a bigger deal in exports coming forward as well. All right. Uh, Jeff, um, right now I think Brazilian grain or South American grain is a little bit, it's priced a little bit better on the world market than ours right now. I think at least out of the Gulf, is, is that right? Uh, is that the case? And is, are there any indications that maybe that'll be changing in 2023? Well, <clears throat> if we can look back and look at the Safrina corn crop that Brazil had, they, they produced a, a better crop, obviously, than they did uh, two years ago. So they had extor exportable corn that was available in through our harvest. And so far, what's really been hurting our export side, if you think about our corn exports, when we take into account what's been sold, we take into account what's been shipped, and this goes all the way back to the, the start of the crop year, which would have started on September 1st, on corn, we're down about 48% on exports, uh, give or take a few, you know, half percent or so. And so, and the reason that's been is that we've had actually, you know, Brazil has been out there with corn that's been cheaper. And as we watch their offerings, they're still cheaper in December than we are. And you get out into the latter part of January, in the first part of February, and we start getting to be more competitive, which we'd expect that. We'd expect that they would physically be running out of exportable corn. Keep in mind, this first crop, the crop that they would have planted this fall, they're basically their, their first crop. That makes up about 25% of their corn production. A lot of that gets used for domestic use. So as a result, not a lot of that first crop will end up being in competition with our corn on the export side. Then we'll start seeing exports as you, know, you think about the Safrina crop right after they start harvesting. And we'll hear them start talking about harvesting soybeans here in a few weeks. It won't be the major, but there'll be a little bit that will get started right behind that soybean crop. Then they'll come in and start planting that safrina corn crop. So, so they'll then have exportable corn as we get out there again. The you know, latter part of July into September, or uh, into August into September, they'll have corn back available. Now, moving over, Chad, on the bean side. You know, right now that we're competitive. It's just the opposite on the bean side. We're competitive. And on the bean exports, actually, we're probably um, where USDA was thinking that we were going to physically be down on exports. Um, right now, actually, it looks like we're going to be up slightly with what the current pace is on beans. Now, that may not hold in because our window of opportunity to physically export on beans is closing fast. We're actually at a point where we're starting to see there's been a few shipments coming out in January where actually Brazil is back um, exporting beans cheaper than we are, but as we get into February and March, they'll be the market. So we've got between now and then to physically make sure that we get the, the bushels sold that we need to and to get the, the exports made. So that's how those are preparing, Chad. All right, questions from the crowd? I think you had one before. Do you want to toss one out? Yeah, I'm curious about uh, what you think of volatility of basis versus commodity prices. Question is, what is uh, how does volatility in basis compare to the volatility in the in the futures market, right? Anybody who wants to uh, try and tackle that one? Uh, I just I answer. I think you know right now you're pro we're probably seeing you know close to a once in a lifetime event, hopefully, and some of the basis volatility. You had, we had such a split in where the crops where the crop was last year and you know where it's needed. Is you know, that balances out you know, your crop, you know it's gonna be an ugly close to you know, these huge premiums at some point. That's gonna move around a lot. You know, and really, you know, looking at your corn and soybeans especially, your basis is a function of the river. We've had river problems this year too, that you know, basis by definition is set set on the Illinois River to your delivery points. If the river's not functional, that's going to affect the futures market. If the river comes back to the function, that moves. Exports maybe move better. That's going to change some of the basis structure, as we've seen, especially you know as they get caught up out west. 
on on having needs covered. You know, we come into next year if we you know hopefully everybody did, gets to grow a crop. You know, that balances things back out. You see probably you know relapse to you know more normal basis structure that we've seen in past years. That's going to be less volatile, and then you probably see a bit more of the action come back in the futures. But you know, in the immediate term, you know the structure is just going to be built built for basis volatility. You know, over over futures volatility. You know, here for a bit, and it's just uh, going to be a rough ride till everybody grows a crop properly. How long? Uh, are we going to grow a crop next year? <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, at that point, it's just you know a function of distributing it, and you know if everybody grows a relatively you know if everybody's crops disappointing, it's one thing. You know, if you know one area is terrible, one area is great. You know, the basis has to, has to redistribute, and it's having to redistribute in a way we haven't seen. You know, probably for a long time. So <laughs> futures have fallen sixty cents here. You know, we were at seven bucks you know, after October report were six forty, so we've fallen sixty and, and the actual basis has fallen probably thirty to you know thirty five cents here in the last you know just two weeks. So the futures have been more volatile, but I think when you go forward here, it's a question we have still these deficits out here. I mean we raise 150 bushel corn to 130 bushel corn in eastern Nebraska. The irrigated areas had a lot of hail, and so there's even in these prime growing areas west of here, which are typically flushing corn. You know, we had troubles getting on irrigation water. We had lost pivots to hail wind that we had earlier. We had lost production. So even though they're trying to pull this corn out of Nebraska, we don't know how much corn is out there. I mean, relative to last year, it's definitely less because we typically raise about 70% of our corn from irrigated corn, you know, in a good year. But this year, it's probably more like 60%, you know, in a drier year. Um, you know, probably that's more evenly, well, let me put, let's just put it the other way. In a dry year, we tend to have, or in a good year, we tend to have more 60, 40, but in a dry year, it tends to be higher based out of our irrigated stuff. So we don't have as much corn around this year to export out of here into Kansas market. So we've gone through these ebbs and flows of the basis, and I think we're gonna keep going through that. We're gonna keep seeing that volatility as these different end users come in and try to you know, pull corn and load it to go back there, whether it's train based or whether it's going trucking. I mean, really, the stuff out of southwest Nebraska or you know, south central Nebraska goes via truck, and that's what's going on. With the high diesel prices, those rates have gone up quite a bit to do that, but that's what's going on right now. It's just, I think we've had, they filled up here temporarily. They're kind of taking a little bit of break, but I think they're going to be back after it again, which would be a good opportunity for us. You know, come and we've done that the last two years. We've had kind of that initial harvest kind of pull for corn coming, make sure they could grab it off the combine. And then we kind of relaxed, and then boom, you know, blew up again. And in and, and February, kind of relaxed again. And then, so I think we're going to go through those kind of that volatility again. Quick question: uh, Do you think they're going to have to start bidding up for corn acres for this coming fall? Ooh, the the acreage discussion going into next year. Uh, anybody have any thoughts on that? I do. I mean, there's uh, commercials are saying three to four million more acres of corn next year, just out of the gate here. If you look at Informa Market or if you look at Ag Resource, a lot of those big groups that are saying we're going to see three to four million. That seems to be a pretty big increase. Now it's going to be a question. I'll flip back and ask you, what do you think you're going to do? But I mean, I've got some people that are saying, okay, well, we were because our yields are down less, you know, last year we retained some of that nitrogen and carry over this year, so we may plant more corn. You know, because of that aspect of it, even though nitrogen prices are higher, but the commercials are saying, hey, we're, you know, kind of the bean corn ratio is, they're thinking that we're going to see three to four more million acres of corn, which implies when you look at those numbers of production with the yield that we could have carry out next year at about 1.8 billion to 2 billion, which is essentially double what we're sitting at right now. And that's why the market is so bearish because they're looking forward. That's a futures market. That's what we deal with is, you know, that's always looking forward is what are those between the U.S. and Brazil, if we raise those crops, what are we going to do? Two years ago, when you were looking out, you could look at those acres and you could look at, okay, yields, weather models, and all that kind of stuff. Well, we're not going to really build the carryover. This year is a different story. And that's why I think you have to be proactive and looking at your 2023 marketing. What do you, when we say, we talk about all these different, you know, kind of minutiae in the markets, but what are we going to do about it? Yep. All right. Hold that thought. We're going to talk more about it. We're going to end out that way. I, if it's okay with you, we're going to go just a little bit long, uh, longer than... 1145 because that's where we're at right now and I still have some questions that I want to ask you guys but maybe let's just do a quick straw poll based on what you said um, how many farmers are, sorry uh, how many how many farmers are thinking more corn acres going into next year anybody is anybody thinking about planting more soybean acres next year 
Um, how many people are uh, undecided? How many people haven't thought about it at all? We got we got to market this year's grain, let alone next year's. Well, hey, we're going to talk about that in a moment here too. Um, I want to do a quick rapid fire with with each of you because there's a lot of topics that we haven't hit on. I'm going to try and hit uh, one individually with each one of you. Let's start with Jeff on the on the end. It was mentioned once or twice the I word, inflation. That's uh, been a, a big topic of conversation just in the economy overall. Where do you see inflation going? How is that going to affect what these farmers do in marketing grain? Well, I think I think we continue. I mean, inflation, I don't see us slowing things up here. That We know that ultimately they're going to continue to raise interest rates higher than what they should, and it's going to have a detrimental effect on the approach they're taking. The thing that's so different about this situation where we've got the inflation, it isn't necessarily because the demand is so terribly strong. It's because we've had problems with the supply side, and there's been so much money flushed into the system. So in my mind, we're going through a situation that really necessarily the feds and how they're approaching this, they don't necessarily have the tools to handle this properly. Properly, They're doing it the only way they can to keep in, uh, bringing up the interest rates, Chad. All right. Uh, Matt, I'll ask you um, about, um, I had a good question, and then it just went, poof. Uh, let me look at my notes. Um, uh, oh, reports. Um, so we have a WASD, I think, on Friday, right? Is that when WASD comes out? Um, yeah, so is, is, there, is there something in that we should key in on, or what, what reports should we be watching to give us an indication of where things are going? Uh, January is going to be the, the much bigger report than this. This week's report. Uh, traditionally, December's, they may change South American numbers a little bit, but traditionally it's just been a reprint of the November report. I wouldn't expect uh, you to see, you know, maybe there's some slight changes, but I wouldn't expect anything major. The big thing with the January report is they give us a grain stocks number that's effectively, a, you know, your end of harvest number, it's you know, December 1st on hand, you know, on farm, in commercial storage, etc. You know, this year we had a fast harvest, so, you know, we've had, certainly had years where in December 1st number, you know, has some questions in it. This isn't one of them. Every, you know, everybody's been done for a while. You that, you know, where that stocks number comes in, you know, what, Relative to expectations, relative to last year, you know, is probably you know we'll set tone you know probably you know for the first part of uh, you know our February January February as we head towards March, see if it influences uh, what people think about what we need to do with new crop. Plus, we'll have a wheat acre number. You know, wheat's been on you know, probably a wilder ride ride than uh, you know, corn and soybeans the past year. You know, see if we've really expanded wheat acres and what that may mean for double crop down the road, and uh, you know. If we plant those plant those uh, wheat acres, uh, do they turn into a crop too? Just given the current conditions uh, on the ground and some of the livestock needs there. Uh, Doug, I'm going to ask you this: um, uh, Are there ways to manage risk with options these days? We haven't talked about uh, we talked about futures, we talked about basis. What about making a floor or something like that? Is does options provide a uh, an economical uh, way to manage risk right now? It, it does. We you know last year. In this early springtime, you know, January, February, we tend to look at selling corn seasonally. If you look at Roy Smith's seasonals or the stuff they've done at Iowa State and at uh, University of Illinois, basically you sell, you know, in the springtime, January through June, seventy-five percent of the time it tends to be higher, you know, then than it does in the in the summer. Um, uh, so if you look at those, you know, seasonals, it says, you know, hey, you know, sell corn. But if you want to do something to kind of slow down the marketing year or slow down the prices, is use some puppets. And, you can, and there's some nice things called short-dated options now where they, you don't have to go all the way out to December. You can use a December-based option, but you can do them in March or April or May. So you can use, you don't have to pay as much money for them. They're a shorter time frame. And they at least get us out here a little bit further into the springtime where we really want to get more aggressive selling corn, just to at least get a floor underneath it. And to protect yourself. Bob Wisner over at Iowa State University I always said, what's the most ideal marketing strategy? You gotta sell your corn when you're put in the planter box. So you gotta come up with some way to you know, protect that crop. And that's what we're looking at this year because especially when we become more better yields and could have better better carryovers and lower prices. All right, Doug, thanks so much. Uh, we're going to round out this, uh, uh, and Ken, we kind of talked about so much more, but I'm, I'm going to round out our marketing uh, discussion by, we went this way uh, to start with, we're going to start on the end and come back this way. We've talked a lot about cash corn or cash grain now, maybe what we have in the bin or what we haven't priced yet. What about the 2023 crop? Uh, Jeff, give me one thing 
that we need to be aware of when it comes to marketing the 2023 corn or soybeans? What's one thing we should be looking out for next year? Well, kind of keep in mind with uh, what we've talked about on South American production, if, uh, if South America has a big crop and we come in, they could produce close to a billion bushel more beans than what they physically produced this past year. And so as a result of that, supply is going to be higher um, with, with basically break-evens where they're at. My belief is we're going to have to be more aggressive, quicker on the 2023 sales than what we've been the past few years. All right, Matt, your turn. One thing, so you can't duplicate his answer, one thing uh, that we need to be aware of for the next marketing year. I think you're going to have to watch to see how some of the forward demand things uh, evolve here, whether it's, you know, where, where our export pace is and potential, you know, especially once the Brazilian crop's known, you know, some, where some of the domestic demand goes, you know, we're seeing the cattle cycle swing and, and get substantially tighter there. Uh, you know, we've had bird flu issues. You know, does that, you know, if that continues to research, do we lose some, leak some demand there? Do we leak it on hogs? Uh, you know, will biofuels, uh, you know, how will they hold up and, you know, how will you know, capacity coming online show up there? You know, if we just keep losing a little bit of demand here and there, you know, that you know, that can accelerate things uh, later on, especially if the crop comes together. So I think that's something we're just going to to be aware of, you know, how that side of the market is progressing too, especially domestically. All right. Doug, you get the second to last word here this uh, uh, soon to be afternoon. Okay, 2023 marketing of grain. So I want to sell futures or I want to buy puts and protect my futures. But the most important thing going forward is I don't want to do a cash contract because I think the basis levels, even though we might have more production out of Brazil, we could have a bigger crop here, there's still going to be a deficit as we go into early harvest next year, like we've been the last two years. So there's going to be opportunities. You sit here, if I'm hedged, to decide if I want to go to Bartlett Council Bluffs or Sire, or I can go to Blair, or I can go to maybe not ADM Columbus. But you can look at those different opportunities, those different spaces. So to be independent, of, you know, and be open to that. You don't have to make decisions about where I'm going to go today. You can get it hedged and protect yourself, which is important. All right, thank you guys. Again, Doug Simon from Trade Haas and Matt Wigan from Futures One, Jeff Peterson, Heartland Farm Partners in Lincoln. Thanks guys for being on the panel today. Appreciate your expertise. And thank you for being here as well and taking an interest in these uh, commodity marketing. Let's give this, uh, let's give our panel a round of applause. Okay? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna take a break. Uh, it does look like there is a, another